we're going to get going. Um, I'd love to uh, greet you all and welcome to today's Alliance member call. Um, we are so thrilled um, to have uh, Dr. Georges Benjamin, who is the executive director of the American Public Health Association and also a Research America board member, join us today. And um, before we get started, I just want to direct your attention to the slide that's on the screen now. I hope you all can see it. That just gives some tips on how to make sure that you can hear this as clearly as possible. Um, we found that joining through the computer is a little bit better than joining by phone. All the lines will be muted until um, we take questions and answers, but please feel free to use the, I guess it's the chat function. I'm so not a technical person, but to send in questions and um, that way, or we'll also be opening the lines for questions. And with that, I'd love to turn this over to Dr. Benjamin. Ellie, thank you very, very much. And I um, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, and um, if we could just uh, go on to the first slide, we're going to talk a bit about coronavirus. Um, uh, next slide. So obviously, uh, this is the picture. I think everybody in the whole world has uh, ha has seen this picture of this of this coronavirus. I um, obviously on the electron microscope is not as pretty, um, but it is a, a pretty nasty organism, and um, all of us are, I guess, sequestered in our homes. Uh, listening to this uh, this uh, webinar today, so um, we're going to talk a little bit about the disease, um, how we got here, and really some other things about what we can do, and we'll take some questions. So the next slide. So there's a big debate still about where it came from, but most likely it comes from a wet mark like this. Um, by the way, while this is a picture of one that's in China, just know that there are wet marks like this all over the world. Um, the challenge with them is, and um, that they're um, having the butchering of animals and they have live animals in the same spot. Um, they also have a lot of exotic animals and these kinds of settings um, put a, a great risk for um, virus genetic interchange of, of, of um, genetic material um, and in many ways foster the potential for these kinds of uh, emerging infectious diseases to occur. Next slide. I like to say that there are really three epidemics here. Um, we always have the, the, the pandemic that we know, the COVID-19 outbreak, um, but we also have an epidemic um, which WHO has um, labeled as an infodemic, which is full of information and disinformation that's, that's around. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that as well. And then I, I'm very much worried about this epidemic of fear, uh, fear of the unknown, lots of misstatements, poor risk communication, but a range of actors uh, in a rapidly communi um, moving communication environment um, where what you said in the morning may not necessarily be the same that you say that night. Um, it ultimately results in a loss of trust and, and certainly some mismanagement, primarily at the federal level, but we're beginning to see that happen in some places at the state level. Next slide. So, this is a family of coronaviruses. Um, you know, we know a little bit about coronaviruses because um, one of the many strains of viruses that cause a common cold um, is the coronavirus. There are, there are other ones, uh, viruses that cause a common cold, but we understand it's in that same family. Um, we saw SARS as an outbreak that came out of um, Asia before, and this is um, SARS COVID 2, which is a related. Uh, virus in the same family of viruses. Um, note that it's also in the family of mirrors, um, which is a virus that um, um, came from camels to infect humans. We've not seen this as a global uh, outbreak, but for many um, years, we've been watching mirrors because we thought mirrors would be the next big pandemic uh, that we were having. Interestingly enough, it wasn't that, it was SARS CoV 2. Next slide. So let me tell you what we know. Next slide. So it is a pandemic. Um, you know, there, as you know, WHO spent some time thinking about when to make that announcement, but but it's absolutely a pandemic. If you go to the next slide, we'll we'll look and see what we mean by that. So this is an older slide. Um, 
this is from March 28th, but it's a just give you a sense that this virus in the shaded areas is truly all around the world. And in the areas in which you don't see covered, there's probably virus there and people that are infected. Um, but reporting is, is always a challenge, particularly from the inner, inner parts of continents. So you may not see the reporting um, all over the world, but we know that um, this is what a pandemic looks like. It's a outbreak across so self-sustaining across many, many nations. Next slide. And this is absolutely the picture, of course, in the United States, but as of uh, April the 3rd, and of course, you know, these numbers have dramatically increased. Um, um, so that, but the idea is that there isn't a state in the nation or territory does not have, that does not have cases. And so, as I saw someone say on TV the other day, the difference between having a few cases and a lot of cases is two weeks. Um, so we need to think about that. So there are a lot of elected officials who are still hemming and hawing about you know, they're, gonna, they're gonna cut down their, their uh, societies. The answer is wait two weeks and you will have wished you had done so. So do it now. Next slide. Give you a sense of what we know about the epidemiology to date. <laughs> you know, the reproductive number, what we call rho, is um, is a number that tells you um, how many people you infect if you're infected. So for this disease, it's somewhere around two. That means for every one of us that's infected, we will infect two other people. And then if you can just consider how that rolls out, those two people then affect two other people, and they affect two other people. Um, and realize rho is an average. So um, it could be three other people, it could be four other people, but on, on, on whole, that's an average. Um, the ultimate goal from a statistical perspective is for us to do some things to get that reproductive number down below one. Um, and so it's not, a, it's not a stagnant number. There are things we can do to do that. Uh, we'll talk about that. There's clearly more infections than influenza. Um, and what we know that if you get the disease, about 80% of us have relatively mild symptoms and someone between 15 to 20% have severe symptoms, including death. Um, many of the people that get sick um, kind of look like they're doing fine, then they get a little worse, then they get really sick pretty fast. Um, <clears throat> we know that right now the case fatality rates between simply one and a half and three and a half. Um, we know that once we begin to understand what the denominator is, in other words, the number of people that are infected that did not get sick, that case fatality rate on the look back, may be smaller, um, but in, in some places it's been much higher than that. Um, so it depends on where you are, um, and we really don't have a true number, but on average, this is where we think it will be. It may come down a little lower. Obviously, community transmission is actually occurring in the United States, um, and we now know that there is asymptomatic spread. We kind of thought there could be, didn't think there was much of it, but it turns out that Again, estimates are anywhere from a quarter to half uh, of the people who are infected may do so either so early in their clinical course that they don't yet have symptoms or are totally asymptomatic. Um, we know that it's primarily spread through um, personal contact, um, through respiratory spread, meaning particulate spread. Um, that's when someone coughs or sneezes and put out large particles out of their mouth or nose. But Aerosolization, we now know is possible. Um, how much it contributes to spread, we don't know. Uh, and fomite contact means that it's a surface. So someone contaminates their hand, they didn't contaminate a doorknob. Um, someone comes behind them and touches the doorknob and then touches their eyes, nose, or mouth. Um, that's how um, you get it by touching a doorknob. Um, we do know this virus can live on surfaces from IRS days. That is the laboratory. Um, span. Um, and, and for all practical purposes, it probably does not last that long in the real environment because it's a very fragile organism that doesn't survive um, the heat very well or UV light very well, et cetera. Um, but again, um, the practice in the, in the world has been that um, more people getting infected and we're not quite sure how all of those people are getting infected. Next slide. 
Uh, just to give you a sense of, of where these fatality rates sit um, compared to um, some of the others, again, the one and a half to three and a half, influenza is 0.1, which is why we tell people not to compare this to influenza um, because there's a, a huge difference between 0.1% and what even the lowest level, one and a half percent. Um, the, the, the famous 1918 flu was about two and a half. Um, SARS was 11, as you see. Um, Ebola, 80%. Um, that's because people got really sick and when they got ex when they got exposed to human secretions. And I'd like to throw in the fact that measles, unvaccinated in the old days, had a, had a fatality rate of one to three percent. So when we when we freak out over measles, that's why in an unvaccinated population. And we know measles is spread by aerosolization. So um, when we push back against the anti-vaccine or vaccination people, that's why. Bad disease, very fatal in an unvaccinated population. The good news is most of us are vaccinated, so we don't see that kind of fatality rate. And obviously we hope that once we get a vaccine for coronavirus, um, we'll be able to reduce that fatality rate um, to very, very low. Um, but what you're seeing now is a, 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 um, a very naive population, meaning that we've not seen this virus before. Next slide. So everybody in the world has seen this slide. Anybody who hasn't seen this slide hasn't been paying attention. Um, this is our ultimate goal. Right now, what we have, since we don't have medical therapeutics, drugs, or vaccine, um, we're using non-pharmacological interventions. And the biggest one is social distancing. And the goal is to take the brown peak and make it look like a blue peak. Um, by reducing the number of people that get sick at any one time, by spreading it out over time, we can provide medical care and hopefully reduce the number of people who actually get infected, as well as reduce the number of, of people who get really sick and die from this disease. And that is what we've been working very, very hard to do. Next slide. And that coupled with good hand washing, you know, washing your hands frequently, 20 seconds, um, covering up your nose and mouth when you cough or sneeze, um, with your elbow or tissue or handkerchief, um, physical distancing, um, which is what we're, we're all doing now, I assume, most of us at home, travel restrictions to limit um, ourselves only to essential travels, and broad closure of events to, to mass events where lots of people will have the opportunity to share, um, uh, per get in personal contact and share the virus with one another. Um, obviously, there are essential businesses like you got to gas up your car, you've got to go grocery shopping. There are certain maintenance things that have to happen. So there's a lot of work right now in, in doing that. And of course, we're readjusting those essential businesses each and every day. Next slide. Um, this is just a graphic um, kind of illustrating what physical distancing is designed to do. And next slide. So this is a, a picture from the 1918 influenza. Um, by the way, we're trying to use the term physical distancing. I didn't change it on this historical slide, um, but because we want to make sure people distance themselves physically from one another, but maintain social cohesion. Um, that, that's very important that they maintain social cohesion. Um, and in 1918, Philadelphia didn't do a great job of it, but St. Louis did. And this just gives you an example of what actually happened in real time in 1918. They were able in St. Louis to flatten that curve through social distancing, uh, even at a time when they didn't really understand viruses. Um, we didn't have any vaccine. We certainly didn't have any therapeutics. Um, but they were able to do this because they, they had some sense that this would work. Uh, and they got good compliance in St. Louis, not so much in Philadelphia. By the way, the folks in Philadelphia, some of the leaders were not very supportive of social distancing at the time. Next slide. Lots of things about testing. I'll just say that, um, you know, we've gone from this very, very um, rigid test, um, which actually measured the virus itself. Um, if you had the virus on your body, we assumed you were infected. Um, and um, initially they were testing to make sure that virus went away before they cleared you. They're no longer doing that. They have some sense on um, how long the virus sticks around. 
<coughs> and they're basically saying, um, if you're, you're infected um, seven days, um, you should be cleared. And in three days past symptoms, you can probably return to work. Um, so it's a little over 10 days from the time you actually get, get sick. I, I like to say two weeks because it makes sense. Everybody's in a mindset of, of, of 14 days. Um, we're obviously still having problems with access to testing. Um, if you have um, this virus, at some point you're presumed to be immunized. Um, and at least, again, this is one of these situations, but I'm gonna tell you something that may be changed in the future. We don't think you can get reinfected at this point. So you're probably uh, immune for some period of time. We just don't know how long that is. Um, and they're now got a new antibody test out, which actually identifies people who had prior infection. And um, again, the antibody test presumes immunity. We will see if that's true over time, but that has been historically the way it's worked with every other infection of this type. Next slide. So from a therapeutic perspective, it's basically general supportive care, keeping your temperature down, drinking lots of fluids, lots of juices, getting some bed rest. Um, if you can get up, you know, exercise, get around, don't just lay around the bed. Uh, but just basically general supportive care is very, very important. Um, vaccines are in development. There are several antiviral agents that are having randomized controlled trials and a range of other uh, immunologic therapies that we have we know may work, and they work on other diseases that are being um, being utilized. And you you probably heard a lot about them in the media, um, but they're all being tested right now um, under a variety of um, uh, of early studies and um, um, a, a use authorizations where a physician can use a particular therapeutic off label, meaning off its official utilization because it's been approved for off-label use. Next slide. So I'm gonna take, take on this issue of infodemic and fear. Um, the, the best way to deal with, with, with um, bad information is the facts, frequently overly communicating the facts, drowning out the, the mis and disinformation, um, correcting it right away. When you see something that's wrong, immediately correct it. Don't pass it around when you see it on your social media. If it sounds like it doesn't make a lot of sense, it's probably misinformation, disinformation, and you need to um, you need to, to to check it out before you pass it along. Um, and we need to work very hard to build trust. Now, a lot of trust has been lost, frankly. This is not a political statement. Um, this is not a bias statement. I've been in the emergency medicine and disaster business for a long time, and trust is the most important attribute that any communicator can have. You can sometimes say the wrong things inadvertently, but you gotta correct it, otherwise you lose trust. And the minute you, you um, skew your answer um, to fit someone's narrative, the, reason, the minute you lie, the minute you give a, give a mistruth, you, you begin to lose that trust and it doesn't take a lot to lose it. Um, so you've got to be very transparent in your communications. Um, it also requires a bedside manner when you when you when you're when you're when you're giving information. You got to think about what else is going on um, when you give that information um, um, to to people. Um, and I I will frequently, as I'm doing right now, um, hoping that each and every one of you is safe and taking care of yourselves because the most important thing you ought to be doing right now is taking care of yourselves and your families. Next slide. And we also don't know a lot. We don't know the true mortality rate. As I said, that will change. We don't know whether or not this will come back. Endemic means that it's actually here as a permanent disease. SARS came and went, <clears throat> didn't really become endemic. Um, influenza is a seasonal um, uh, disease, although it's beginning to, to creep in. Um, the common cold is um, endemic. It's around all the time. Um, we don't know all the ways it's spread. We have some sense of that. We don't have a lot of sense on pregnant women and fetus so far. Um, it doesn't seem to have a major impact on pregnant women and fetus, but as those children grow up, we'll, we'll, we'll find out whether it did. We know the, the virus does um, infect a lot of organs other than the lungs. 
Um, so we just have to be concerned about that. Uh, children tend to tolerate this reasonably well, except very young children who probably have a lower immunity status. Um, and they said overall, children seem to have a lower morbidity and mortality. Um, and that's been true, not just in the US, but in other countries. That does not mean that young people can't get it. Um, because we made it probably an overemphasis on being 60 and older uh, and having the, uh, having um, a high risk. We also know that that certain groups like minorities who are disproportionately impacted by chronic diseases, if they get infected, will have a higher morbidity and mortality. And tragically, we're seeing that in, in, in New Orleans, in Chicago, in Detroit, in Milwaukee. Um, um, we're beginning in other cities urban settings in particular, we're beginning to see that the, the impact on um, particularly the African-American community um, has been absolutely devastating. Uh, and we don't know actually about children as carriers. We know that influenza, um, children, I love my kids, but they're little germ people um, and they bring their influenza home with them and infect their parents. Um, and they do that every, every holiday, uh, which is why the kids, um, it's just as they go, they get the, just about get the, the influenza they tolerate it very well. They go home for Christmas, they give it to their parents. Their parents then come to work and give it to everybody else, which is why we obviously want everybody to get their influenza and their flu shot every year, including kids. Next slide. <laughs> and obviously everybody's asking the important question, when do we go back to normal? And the answer is um, COVID-19 will drive, drive that decision. Um, we may be able to modulate how we manage it back but if the virus doesn't go away, doesn't change, doesn't do anything differently, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna be in our houses for quite a while. If it changes or we're able to effectively social distance ourselves and manage that process so that we can manage the viral exposure better, then we're likely to get back to work better and faster. Next slide. Obviously we've seen bad outbreaks before. Um, it may seem like this is the apocalypse, and in some communities, tragically, right now it is. Um, but this is what we saw with the 1918 influenza, huge wards, um, reminiscent of tragically what we're seeing right today um, because of COVID-19. Next slide. And here's a series of resources, both APHA's website, CDC's website, um, very authoritative website, and, and of course, the World Health Organization, all three of us have information um, um, about this. And, and of course, there are other groups that, that do so as well. Um, with that, I think that's my last slide. And I think, I, I, next slide, and I think it's questions. There we go. So Wonder happy questions. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Dr. Benjamin, can you hear me? I can very well, thank you. Wonderful, well, thank you so much. We're gonna... Um, turn to questions. I, I'd love to start with just one. And that is, I, I try to picture what it would mean to be able to go back to kind of, it'll never be the, exactly the same, but the back to where we are interacting with one another. How would we know for sure that it's safe to do so without a treatment or a prophylactic, a vaccine? Yeah. Well, a couple things. Obviously, we're all tracking the um, the um, disease process, the number of sick and dying. So, in any community, you want to see the number of people who died beginning to go down. You want to see the number of cases, and that's a lagging indicator, by the way. You should see the number of cases going down, and then you see the number of deaths go down. And it may be hospitalizations may very well be a surrogate of that. Um, that's one important measure. The second important measure is we have enough tests that we, through our surveillance system, and there is some surveillance testing going on now, but not nearly enough, um, that can say, look, we've, we've, we've um, sampled a large percentage of the people in this community, this population, and we know we get herd immunity at somewhere around 80 plus percent. Um, and so when you start seeing um, enough people who have had the disease um, so that we're not, you're breaking that, that row I talked about and bringing that down so that every person who, who might be infected, if they go to four people, 
and um, theoretically they're going to infect all four of them. But if two of them have had uh, are immunized, then they'll only infect two. If three of them are immunized, they're only going to infect one. If all of them have had the virus before, even if they didn't know it, because we've tested their um, their immune status, they'll pass it on to nobody, and it will simply stop with their infectious phase. So the idea is um, we know that we have good surveillance and um, we're seeing on the clinical side death and disability going away. L let me also add that while no one's talking about the shoe leather epidemiology, that is continuing to go on right now. We're do still doing case finding, contact tracing, and that's the other very, very important part here. Because you don't, with the surveillance, you will find people who are positive. You're going to have to still deal with their contacts and have them self um, uh, quarantine if they're not sick, isolate if they are. And um, that's going to be very, very important. So the basic public health function um, is going to absolutely have to be beefed up in this country in order for us to get back to work. And I, I saw one city, I think maybe Massachusetts, I, I think it may be that's already starting to figure that process out um, and trying to, to, in essence, train and deputize people on an aggressive basis to do the case finding um, because that will get us back to work very, very quickly, assuming we we're over the clinical hump. Well, that's that was terrific. I feel like I've got a better handle for sure. Let me turn it now to Terry to, I think Terry, you've been fielding questions that have been coming through on text. Yes, that's right, Ellie. Um, and a reminder to all our listeners, you can type your questions in the questions box and we'll also have a chance at the end for those of you who are on the phone. Um, our first question is from our very own uh, Mary Woolley. Uh, she says, first of all, thank you for what you and your APHA colleagues are doing to face down this pandemic. Um, can you speculate a bit about what will change in society, including our appreciation of the role of public health when we finally get to the other side of this pandemic? Well, I'm, I'm hoping, and you can be sure I'm going to message it this way, <clears throat> that every person in this country, if they're not primarily in a public health job, public health is their second job. Grocery store clerks, people who deliver our mail, the folks doing our, our yards, all those people that are keeping our society going so that the rest of us can do what we do, and particularly those healthcare workers um, that are in the hospitals, uh, every one of them, their second job is public health. So now that we all know that we practice public health, I'm hoping that we'll be willing to invest in a, in a, a, a robust, sustainable public health system. And what I mean by that is one that can know when a new disease enters the community, assess it, control it, get rid of it, and prevent it from happening in the future. And that also means a strong research base so that we can accelerate um, discoveries and cures and tests um, so that what we've learned from this is that we have great researchers, but we didn't put them to work as fast as we could have. And, um, and they still need more tools. So I hope that the investment includes a strong investment in research as part of that. Um, and then a health system that um, is not so much on just-in-time supply lines, for sure, and a health system that has, you know, telemedicine was kind of uh, an interesting tool that some people were using, it's now become mainstream. And telemedicine is going to be the way to go for a lot of the medicine we're practicing in the future. That is not going to go back to the way it was before this outbreak. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, some other questions that are coming in. Um, this one, is there any research looking at genetic markers that would indicate folks who are likely to have mild symptoms? Um, I don't know about genetic markers, but I know that people are trying to figure out um, what, what measures might be there, whether there are symptoms or signs um, that, that trip you off to somebody um, is infected before they may have symptoms 
or early symptoms, or in, in a course, trying to identify those people. You may have mentioned that 80% of the folks pretty much do well. How can we identify folks that might go on to, to crash um, very quickly? Um, one of the things that happens is something called cytokine storm. Basically what that means is your body um, has such a robust immune response that it attacks itself. And, and we're seeing that happen. So to the extent we can identify markers that might identify people that are much more likely to have that happen, um, I think that'll be very important because we can therefore identify people that can stay at home or need to be in the hospital or there are, there are immune modulators that people are experimenting with today to try to alter that process. Um, now, just understand you've exhausted all of my knowledge of immunology. That's very helpful, thank you. And um, another question, of course, a lot of people have questions about testing and what we know. Um, as antibody tests are now available, uh, do you have a sense of when these tests will become more broadly available? And it, can they show that if you're antibody positive, you are able to go back to work? Yeah, that, that's all proof of concept that's happening right now. That's the hope. Um, and um, there, there are a couple antibody tests. There's one that for sure I know that's been um, released for early use. Uh, you know, as, as Dr. Guerrero said yesterday, they're not necessarily approved, whatever that means. Um, but they are, they are, they are out there in play. They are beginning to use them. And and the truth of the matter is, until they do a large segment of the population, look at this, look at the evidence, um, and and then put those people out. They got to get re-exposed somehow. Um, and know that they're really immune, um, we, we won't know. And, and, and that, that's gonna be um, a thing to watch. So they'll be drawing blood from people, checking their immune status, following them over time, seeing if they get sick or not again. Um, and then that coupled with all those other things I said before um, will help us decide whether or not it's safe to, to go back to work. Great. And of course, uh, one thing that's on everyone's mind is the test uh, availability of testing overall. Um, have you got anything, um, any word on how widespread testing is now and any projections for how that's going to go in the near future? You know, that's funny. Um, you're right. It, it, it is a challenge. Um, and and just, just say the CDC was amazing um, doing SARS. That test worked. I don't know all the reasons it failed this time. Um, but in a, in, a, in a global world, which we have now, there are all kinds of shortages which are impacting testing from reagents, the tests not being as effective as we would like, differences in techniques around the world, even though you may see lots of people saying they're doing lots of tests, a lot of questions about how accurate false positives, false negatives of of some of those tests, including our own, by the way, um, that have to be resolved. Um, that will get resolved over time. Um, but once we have, once we look at the data from viral tests, which they're doing, the nasal swabs, looking at data from antibody testing, um, and looking at um, some of the, the various methodologies of the different tests we'll get a sense of which test really, really is the best. Um, uh, why, why is that important? Because if this thing is seasonal, tragically, we'll get the opportunity to do this again next year, um, but we'll have different tools. You know, We'll probably shut down sooner. We'll have antiviral agents, I hope. A year and a half from now, for sure, we'll have a vaccine. Well, we might have a vaccine, I hope we do. Um, so the world will be different. It may come back, but it'll be different. And more importantly, you have a large percentage of the world that has been, it will be immunized um, in effect because they've been exposed to the virus. So um, we'll just have to wait and see what happens with that. Great, thank you so much. Um, another question coming in, there's been some uh, misinformation, perhaps you mentioned the uh, infodemic around which pre-existing conditions uh, put people at a higher risk. What do we know about which populations outside of the elderly are truly at a higher risk? 
Well, we, we know that anyone who has um, uh, congestive heart failure, for example, um, is, is one. Um, um, coronary artery disease, hypertension, diabetes scores pretty high on this list. People with underlying chronic obstructive lung disease, asthma. Um, you know, the, the, the virus has a predilection for the airway and the pulmonary system. Um, but it appears that to, to also attack the GI tract, the heart, and there's some evidence to brain. Um, and, and they don't know a lot about that, but they're seeing people that come in with severe chest pain who they have didn't cath and find out they don't have a, they're, they're positive, but they don't have any coronary, vas coronary artery disease. Um, people who have diabetes have been presenting with diabetic ketoacidosis, i.e. their blood sugar is out of control and they're not metabolizing sugar well. Um, so uh, it's really the exacerbation of underlying chronic disease in the face of enormous stress, um, which is what the virus puts you under. And then to the extent it attacks particular organs, that's a problem uh, as well. And as I mentioned, if you then get this um, cytokine storm event, um, that, that's a problem on top of all your other problems. Um, and people don't do very well when that happens. So, that, you know, my, w disproportionate populations, you know, African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans all have higher incidence of those disease um, than the white population. And um, so, therefore, if they get the infection, they're more at risk of getting sicker or dying because of the underlying disease. Great, thank you so much. I wanted to check in with our listeners to see if anyone who is on the phone has a question. Um, if you do, you can simply uh, click star six and that should unmute you if you'd like to ask a question. Anyone who is on the phone? Okay, well, if not, I know, uh, Dr. Benjamin, you also had a couple of things you wanted to share about National Public Health Week. Well, thank you very much. So everyone, this is National Public Health Week. Um, and we had an amazing forum yesterday. Um, wanted to, uh, is there, is you have the next slide on that? Um, these, are, these are the events for the day. Um, yesterday was we're talking about mental health. Um, today, we're talking about maternal and child health. Tomorrow will be violence prevention. We have a big student day on Thursday, including a discussion on environmental health. We're focusing on education and then healthy housing and economics. You notice that we're focusing very much on the social determinants of health um, and a couple of high-risk populations like women and children and people with, with behavior health issues. Um, and that's because during this week, um, we talked about, this is the 25th anniversary of National Public Health Week. We wanted to talk a lot about the social um, issues which, which we know influence 80% of what makes you healthy. Um, so we just encourage you to, to be involved. Um, I saw that Google, uh, if you haven't seen it, is celebrating all of the health workers that are involved, including public health, um, um, on the meme that they put on the top of the Google page. And, um, just kudos to um, um, Karen DeSalvo and her state, her team um, at Google, because I'm sure they, were, they they had their their fingerprints all over it. Some of you may remember Karen was the former uh, Assistant Secretary of uh, Health for HHS uh, and a strong public health advocate. Um, so lots of good stuff going on. And we have one more slide. Uh, remind people the the steps campaign. I know it's tough to get your steps in. But you can walk around your house with your mask outside. And you can walk them down the stairs and encourage you to walk around as much, maintain your steps, get up and be physically active. Um, don't do like I am right now, sitting in front of a, uh, um, a, a, a computer screen all day, but you got to get up and walk around. And then we have the Twitter chat on, um, on April the 8th. I encourage all of you to get involved in the Twitter chat. It's um, to follow at National Public Health Week. Um, and use the, um, um, the hashtag um, um, National Public Health Week chat um, to be involved. And you'll see there is an RSP, RSVP there. Uh, if you just go to the APHA.org website, um, um, you, can, you can find all the stuff about National Public Health Week. So with that, 
I think that's the last slide. I want to thank you very, very much. Thank Great. you. I'll, oh, go ahead, Ellie. Yeah, that was just, um, that was terrific. We so, so appreciate it. Um, I just need to do a one minute housekeeping on other topics, but um, we really truly th can't thank you enough for this. It was such a terrific presentation. For those on the lines, um, I just wanted to remind you all that we have an Alliance member call this Thursday um, with Adrian Hallett from NIH to talk about uh, grants flexibility, some of the other issues that are ongoing um, uh, in the NIH sphere, and um, more Alliance member calls to come. We'll also be, we're thinking very hard about advocacy around the supplemental, the fourth supplemental, and the needs, the NIH infrastructure needs, not only lab and bricks and mortar needs, but the need to um, make sure that the uh, research capacity can be sustained and restarted. Um, all the labs that are right now um, shuttered because of, of COVID-19 and or reprogramming towards COVID-19, the costs of getting back up and running and can, you know, continuous research capability going forward that we need for pandemic preparedness and for all the other health threats we face. So more to come on that. We're, um, we're figuring that out as we go and um, we'll be in touch. So thanks so much for joining us. I guess um, we can um, end here. Thank you. Great, thank you. Take care, all. All right, thank you. Thanks, Georges. Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. <laughs>